In today's world, many know Elon Musk as the founder of Tesla and CEO of SpaceX, but he may soon become a worldwide internet monopoly figure as well, which is something Russia is not the happiest about. In this video, we are going to examine why the Russians and those of some other countries are so wary of the Starlink project. What's more, we will also look at the use of this technology as it relates to military applications. Let's dive right in. The starting point for the Starlink project is considered to be 2014, when the project's early planning initially began. However, it really should be 2007 when Greg Weiler first founded O3B Networks, whose shareholders included satellite operator SES, which purchased 49.5% of the shares, Google, HSBC, and Liberty Global. SES saw massive potential in Weiler's idea at the start, having bought out the shares of all other shareholders of O3B Networks by 2016. The name O3B itself is an abbreviation for Other 3 Billion, which serves as a reminder of the 3 billion people who did not have access to the internet in 2007. The project's main task was the creation of a group of satellites moving at an altitude of about 8,000 kilometers from Earth right above the equator. It was assumed that they would be able to provide broadband internet to the part of our planet's population living between 45 degrees south and 45 degrees north latitude. Such a large-scale project was not without its drawbacks, of course. The biggest one was that in order to receive this network, a complex comprising two antennas with a diameter of about 8 feet and a price tag of $120,000 was required. Of these, one received a signal, tracking a flying satellite, and the second was simultaneously guided over to the next spacecraft in order to change the first one as soon as its satellite was below the horizon. The governments and telecoms of African countries, Pacific Island states, and the Pentagon for their overseas bases quickly took interest in the project. However, due to the high price of equipment, the provision of such a service remained sky high for villagers and most private parties. The idea needed a sort of paradigm shift towards greater accessibility. And then such a project appeared. However, it was proposed by Google internally having filed a patent application for a satellite constellation to provide broadband, internet access via a network of gateway ground stations and inter-satellite links. The brains behind the concept was Mark Krebs, who joined the Dobra Corporation back in 2013. He also brought Elon Musk into his project, who was, at that time, only just laying the foundation for his future success, switching to the Falcon 9 version 1.1 and docking the Dragon cargo spacecraft at the ISS. The billionaire was assigned the role of delivering satellites into space and to their manufacturer. A little later in 2016, Krebs would move over to SpaceX. Then in 2018, he would join the Amazon Kuiper project headed by Elon Musk's sworn friend Jeff Bezos, where he still works. In 2014, both Google management and Greg Weiler apparently failed to share something. This caused the latter to refuse to cooperate subsequently founding his own project, OneWeb, formerly known as Worldview. Elon Musk, in turn, secured funding from Google, then left to work on his own project as well. The billionaire's first mention of Starlink came in November 2014, when he voiced the imminent announcement of a new project related to satellite groups. In January 2015, the first office in Redmond, Washington was opened having been created specifically for the development of Starlink. And in November 2016, the FCC received the first application from Musk to utilize the frequency spectrum of the KU and Ka bands for a satellite constellation of 4,425 spacecraft. The company received official permission almost two years later in March of 2018, and just over a year later, in April of 2019, the FCC approved SpaceX's application to change the previously announced Kuban network. At this point, we're now looking at 1,584 satellites at an altitude of 550 kilometers, as opposed to the previous 1,150 kilometers with an inclination of 53 degrees. Alongside this, in March 2017, the company also created an additional application for a group of 7,518 satellites to use the V-band frequency spectrum. In this particular case, the permit did not take as long, having gone through by November 2018. The first tests with the Falcon 9 launch vehicle bearing the first Microsat 2A and Microsat 2B satellites were carried out in February 2018. These were later given the new names, 1010A and 1010B. These are version 0.1 satellites. 
In December of that same year, SpaceX was offered a $28 million three-year contract from the Strategic Development Planning and Experiments Division of the United States Air Force. This was due to the military searching for various ways to use the Starlink satellite network for their own purposes. A little later in 2019, representatives from the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, AFRL, recorded an impressive speed of 610 megabytes per second in flight, demonstrating a data transmission channel via Starlink with the Beechcraft C-12 Huron aircraft. And in 2020, they used Musk's brainchild to support their advanced battlefield control systems during live fire exercises. Starlink was connected to various air and ground targets to include the Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker. The promotion of subscriber terminals is considered to have started in December of 2019. It was then that SpaceX filed an application with the FCC to include one million such devices in the foreseeable future. Then in May, various social media platforms were literally flooded with retweets and reposts of the Starlink train video, which displayed numerous satellites from the group, thus resembling a train moving through the night sky. This was performed to the exclamations of an admiring audience and the indignation of astronomers and so began a short-lived but nonetheless important milestone in the journey Starlink versus the astronomical community. Lowell Observatory in Arizona presented an image with 25 diagonal lines distorting the observation of a distant cluster of galaxies. Each of these lines was due to the orbital trajectory of the Starlink satellites as they moved in front of the exposure. SpaceX quickly responded to complaints from astronomers assuring them that the work was being done with leading astronomical organizations to ensure that their satellites do not disrupt the work of other specialists. It was promised that future versions of the satellites would have a black coating instead, thus reducing their reflective effect on astronomical observations. They would also adjust the satellites' orbits so that astronomers could successfully perform even the most sensitive observations. One of the most high-profile cases for interference for astronomers involved 19 Starlink devices, which for five minutes interfered with the work of the DE CAMS telescope designed to search for traces of dark energy. After seven successful launches with Starlink satellites versions 0.9 and 1.0 from November 2019 to March 2020, Elon Musk made an official announcement on April 23, 2020, regarding the start of a closed beta test in three months and a public beta test was promised to be set another three months after. The first photo of devices was taken in Maryland, Wisconsin, which was followed by a quick dissemination on the network. Warm responses from potential customers, combined with the company's own enthusiasm as it applied to register the second generation of the Starlink network in June 2020. This was to be composed of 30,000 satellites set in orbits ranging anywhere from 328 to 614 kilometers. At the same time, the Internet begins to see the first frames of test regarding a service speed of 60 megabytes per second, along with a delay of 31 milliseconds. The company also receives an FCC certificate for a Wi-Fi router for Starlink terminals, and SpaceX asks the FCC to extend the previously requested permission for 1 million subscriber devices up to 5 million. This decision was primarily motivated by the fact that the company received over 700,000 applications for testing from various interested parties. Elon Musk's primary goal sounded, albeit eccentric, but still extremely inspiring. He intended to change the internet traffic situation in space so that 10% of local traffic and 50% of long-distance and international internet traffic could go through the satellite network. In addition to this, he hinted that such an internet could hardly be free for the user and the company itself would have to gain support and funding estimated at around 10 to $15 billion. The final cost could potentially exceed these initial marks. At the same time, however, they preferred to leave the cost of subscriber terminals at a much more accessible $100 to $300. Although in the end it turned out to be higher than expected, settling at $499. The most ambitious part of the project, though, was a plan to route funding of the city through Musk via significant profits generated by Starlink. In 2017, the Wall Street Journal published material from journalists who had claimed having access to SpaceX's 2015 business plan. According to this, Starlink was supposed to overtake SpaceX in revenue by 2020, and in 2025 its revenue was predicted to reach $30 billion per year, six times more than Musk's rocket business, while serving 40 million subscribers. 
Considering that the combined total revenue of the five largest satellite operators in the world, Intelsat, SES, Inmarsat, Telesat, and Utilsat was about 7.75 billion in 2019. The goal of 30 billion by 2025 seemed practically unattainable. Morgan Stanley also shared its outlook for Starlink's business, stating that the project would not generate positive cash flow until around 2033. In 2020, a record of 230 megabytes per second appeared on the Starlink network. A little later, it broke through at around 330 megabytes per second. Today, the maximum speed is 430 megabytes per second, with an initial $499 starting payment and $99 monthly service fees. Subscribers were more than happy with these results. Another indisputable advantage was the terminal's operability in any given temperature weather conditions. Thus, Starlink terminals can be officially considered all-weather. Additionally, SpaceX's entry into the markets of various countries has proven to be a huge success. In addition to the 15 subsidiaries already established in the largest world countries, the company began to provide services in Canada, Germany, New Zealand, and the UK, going through the full cycle from creating a subsidiary to obtaining a license, rights to frequencies, creating a gateway, warehouse, and settings on logistics systems. Investors strongly believe Musk's idea will succeed. Not long after making significant advances in promoting the Starlink project, SpaceX released a $1.9 billion new share offering at a price 60% higher than the previous one. While most people living in the remote regions of various countries were ecstatic at the imminent opportunity to become familiar with all the benefits of the modern international web, at a decent speed, a number of providers and countries strongly opposed such manifestations of freedom. One of those who opposed Musk's initiative was Russia. The state Duma is considering the possibility of imposing fines on individuals and legal entities using SpaceX services in the country. This would also cover OneWeb satellites and any other devices developed by foreign companies. The recommended fine for those subscribers who nevertheless dare to order one of the devices from Starlink would range from $130 to $400 and anywhere from $6,750 to $13,500 for legal entities using services provided by the Western system. Considering that the head of Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, has long been exchanging pleasantries with Elon Musk via Twitter and views SpaceX as the main competitor in space flights, such bans have not exactly come as a surprise for very many. But in his statements, Rogozin decided to push things even further, claiming that Starlink is nothing more than a scheme for providing uninterrupted communications with U.S. Special Forces, accusing American authorities of yet another attempt to advance their military interests. In order to keep up with its foreign counterparts, Russia also intends to create its own satellite internet project called Sphere. However, there have been many questions thus far regarding the availability of such a large-scale venture especially with the launch of the first devices scheduled for 2024. The project's budget has not yet been finalized, although some reports have cited a cost of about $20 billion, which is significantly more than the amount spent by Russia on civilian space missions. The current budget of the Roscomos is approximately $2.4 billion a year. China is also competing with Russia for control of censorship. Authorities there have expressed interest in deploying their own version of the global satellite internet exclusively. In February of last year, the PRC began testing one of seven prototypes belonging to the Hong Hyun satellite system. The first phase of the project, which involves the launch of several thousand satellites into near-Earth orbit, is planned for 2022. The second phase of putting communication satellites into operation is scheduled for 2025. This, according to the PRC government, will allow the country to provide access to satellite internet around the world. There will be two networks comprising of 12,992 satellites. One will have 6,080 satellites set to an altitude of 508 to 600 kilometers above the Earth, and the other will have 6,912 satellites at an altitude of 1,145 kilometers. Another major problem regarding the provision of internet access without permission is the legal regulations concerning radio wave transmissions. When asked what governments such as Venezuela, Afghanistan, or North Korea can do to block access to Starlink, Musk responded, they can shake their fists at the sky. However, dictators do have leverage of their own, so it is unlikely that SpaceX will try to bypass the borders of authoritarian countries like Iran, which maintain international relations with the other powerful governments. 
China imports significant volumes of oil from Iran and will not likely respond well to attempts at destabilizing its government. In the meantime, while China and Russia are busy planning, SpaceX continues to actively launch its Starlink platforms. The last launch took place on November 13, 2021 from Cape Canaveral, when the Falcon 9 departed with 53 satellites on board. Furthermore, the world recently saw the new incarnation of the subscriber terminal UT2. It was with this that the company saved the device from flaws earlier encountered, such as a tightly connected PoE cable, 100 feet long instead of 75. The Ethernet port for connecting a foreign router was removed from a separate power supply. The most important technical aspect, however, was the increased area of use on the antenna. 73% for the new version versus 57% for the UT1. The latter notably improved both signal reception and network speed. What are your views on the future of satellite internet? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's video, please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe for more content. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next video.